Okay. So thank you all again for being here. And I'm so happy that you are. I'm so happy that you're taking this step to get to know the plants that grow all around you and to empower yourself with some good green food. So today, um, I wish that we could all introduce ourselves, but there's quite a few people here, which I'm so excited to see because the more people that get into foraging, the more that we can eat and the more that we can teach each other and empower each other. Uh, I do want to say one important guideline today, a rule, if you will, which is please only eat wild foods if you're absolutely sure that you know what they are, if you have 100% positive identification, I like to say. So um, I am going to share my screen with you and my, you'll see my embarrassing number of uh, tabs maybe that I have open, but here we go. So I have a slideshow to show you, but I'm still gonna be here still going to be talking to you. And um, again, if you have any questions, then um, put them in the chat box. And if I don't answer them, then I will, um, sorry, I wasn't at the beginning. Um, if I don't see them, then I will come back to them at the end. So, there we go. All right. Okay, so this is what we're talking about today. Appalachian wild edibles of summer. And um, yeah, this is a plant, the first one that we're going to talk about, and it's one that is super special to me. So if anybody knows it, you can type it in the chat. You just got like a little cheat because it came up there. But here it is. So this is one that, this is the Cherokee name for this plant. And this is called Sochan, that is a Cherokee word. And its Latin name is Rubecchia Liciniata. And if you don't want to learn the Latin, that is totally okay. <laughs> um, but it does tell us, right, that it's related to other Rubecchias that might be growing in our garden, like Black Eyed Susan is in this genus. So you may be growing things like this in your own garden. Um, if you know Echinacea, it looks very similar to that, and that's because it's in the aster family. So I don't have time to go into all that right now, but things that look like daisies basically are usually in the aster family. Um, so what else about this plant? Well, I put in here remembering on whose land we stand because in much of Appalachia, we're in on what was originally Cherokee land and a lot of other tribes. So I just think that it's important um, through my nonprofit, The Wander School, the work that I do, we work a lot with the Cherokee and are helping to co-create a Cherokee herb school. And um, we work with other tribes as well. So it's really important to me to remember whose land we are on and to honor those people. Um, so this is a very important green to Cherokees. I actually was just at a large um, memorial ceremony this past weekend um, with some friends and they had a whole bunch of this plant cooked up. So it's the greens of the plant. So if you look at this picture and you look at those leaves, you can see that they're very uniquely shaped, right? So another name for this plant you can see on this slide is cut leaf coneflower. And that's because it has those big cuts in the leaf. And so um, those, those lobes, with the deep cuts out in between them. 
And another name for this plant is green headed cone flower because the the part that the flowers are sorry the well we're going to get into some deep botany if we go there so part that the petal looking parts are attached to is kind of greenish so that's why it's called green headed cone flower and so it has lots of different names and this plant loves to grow in what some biological people call riparian or riparian ecosystems. So that means that they're by water. So they like to grow on stream banks and river banks and creek banks and things like that. And they usually grow pretty prolifically. So as long as we know that we have 100% positive identification, we can pick them abundantly, especially if we're just picking the leaves and we pick like a leaf off every plant, then that plant will continue to regrow. And so um, what my Cherokee friend Tyson taught me is that he and the Cherokee folks that he has wild crafted with will actually pick these one stem at a time. So if you think about that, um, it's going to take a long time, right? So yeah, it just, I think it's important for us to think about how these things are done by native people. And when you pick something like that one stem at a time, it really makes you have a lot more appreciation um, for the plant and the work that it takes to pick them. So then once you have picked them, the Cherokee way to cook them is to boil them for a really long time. So more like simmer than boil and you simmer them for about 45 minutes. So it really cooks it down. And then um, you cook it in some kind of grease. So that could be animal fat, some kind of lard. It could be butter, it could be oil, but then it cooks way, way, way down. So really small. So if you think about you're picking one leaf at a time and then you boil it that long and it shrinks way down, how long would that take you? So this is your choice. You can do it how you want. You can pick more than one leaf at a time. Um, and so I should have said, the reason why they hand pick each one is because you're touching each stem. So it's really creating a relationship for you with that plant. And I think that's pretty awesome. But if you wanna pick them more quickly, you can take some scissors or some pruners and just cut that stem um, above maybe the second leaf from the bottom on that plant. And then you'll be getting a bunch of leaves at the same time. So it's really up to you, but um, we'll talk about this in another class specifically on foraging, but it's really important. And I like to remember gratitude. So creating some kind of gratitude process for yourself. I think is, or practice, is really important. So again, if y'all have questions, please put them in the chat and um, I will answer them as I can. So any questions on Sochan? Anybody? Okay, I'm gonna go on to our next plan. Okay, so this plant actually looks a lot like Sochan and um, it has a lot of names too. So if anybody's familiar with this, please um, put in the comment that you are and if you've tried it and your experience with it. So um, I'm laughing because some of the notes on the bullets here, but um, the name that many of you may know already for this one is Jerusalem Artichoke but it's really funny because it is number one, not from Jerusalem. Number two, it's not an artichoke. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's kind of a misnomer, I guess. 
But some people think it got the Jerusalem part of its name because there is a tribal name for it, which is Jusa. I can't remember which tribe that comes from off the top of my head. But somebody thought, well, maybe Jerusalem sounds like that. So that's where that came from. Um, the artichoke part, I think, was because it tasted a little bit like artichoke. Oh, good. People are responding. Great. Okay. I'm glad that you adjusted the volume on your computer and that worked. Yay. And a couple of people have tried it and love it. So that's awesome. Um, so another name for this one is sun choke. And I think that's because it's so yellow and sunny. That's my opinion anyway. <laughs> but, um, and then some people call it J choke because it's like Jerusalem artichoke and it's just kind of an abridged version. And so the um, Latin name for this one is helianthus tuberosus. And so that helianthus part, it's in the same genus as sunflower. So it's closely related. The tuberosus part is you can see these tubers down here. So kind of like uh, um, ginger, right? Looks kind of like ginger. And um, even though I think technically it might be a rhizome, but that's where botany gets tricky again. <laughs> so interestingly, these were cultivated and are cultivated. I'm sorry, I try not to talk about native peoples in the past tense because they're still here. They're still doing these things. So they are cultivated by Native American tribes. And that's because in my experience, you get a lot bigger tuber rhizome um, once you cultivate them. Because when they grow in the wild, a lot of times I'll find them growing through compacted soil. And so they're using all their energy to get through that soil. You can't really expand. So if you grow them in nice, rich, loose soil, those roots will get bigger. And so that is the part that most of us eat. And you can eat them raw. My friend Doug Elliott, who some of you may know or know of, um, says that he'll just slice it really thin and put it in his salad. Um, but it has a lot of inulin in it. And so inulin is this great phytochemical, which um, I like to remember it because it sounds like insulin. And so what does insulin help us do? Balance our blood sugar. And so this does that naturally, the artichoke, Jerusalem artichoke root or tuber rhizome um, naturally balances our blood sugar. So it's pretty cool that way. And um, however, inulin can also cause gas. So some folks I know call them fartichokes. <laughs> sorry to say, but um, kind of funny. Uh, so it may help you if you cook them first. You can boil them, you can roast them. They're really tasty that way. It helps the sugars come out, the natural sugars. And um, there's lots of things you can do with Jerusalem artichoke. So if anybody has something that you love to do with them, then put that in the chat. Um, oh yeah, Jennifer, yes, eat the tuber. As far as I know, that is the only part that I eat and people that I know eat. Um, the flowers may be edible. That's a good question. I have some resources later, but if you go to pfaf.org, I'll type it in the chat here. Um, or if anybody knows, if anybody out there eats the flowers, let us know. The, the leaves can be kind of scratchy and that's one of the ways that we identify them. So there's that pfaf.org plants for future. And you can look up a lot of these plants and donate if you can, um, cause they put out a lot of great info. So yeah, you can cook those tubers. And, oh, good question. Jen is asking if any of the plants have poisonous lookalikes around here. Well, one, I'm not sure where you are, Jen, sorry. Uh, two, that's honestly the hardest question I get asked because it really depends how much knowledge that you have and how much experience. So the less knowledge and experience you have, the more likely there is to be a lookalike. So it just takes really getting to know what the plants. Um, 
And so, but that's a really good question because I put on this bottom bullet point, it has alternate and opposite leaves. So technically it starts out alternate, the leaves at the bottom of the stem. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm talking about the leaf arrangement of the plant. So how the leaves are arranged on the plant. So if you see this picture, you can kind of tell on that middle flower there that it has leaves directly opposite each other. So that's opposite leaf arrangement. And then alternate leaf arrangement is when they're not directly opposite and they alternate on the plant. So the leaves actually start out alternate on the bottom of the stem and then they become opposite. But I was just looking at some the other day and they looked like they lost their bottom leaves. So they all looked opposite. So that makes it a little tougher. Um, but they do tend to be like what one of the words we use. There are actually a lot of words in botany, a lot of terms that we use to describe hairy. And um, one of them that I like the most, and also Doug Elliott said, is like one of the best, I think it's a homophone, but like when a word sounds like what it means, sort of. Um, but anyway, the word that describes this is scurfy. <laughs> and so um, it's like when you rub those hairs, they're really stiff and they kind of make a sound when you rub them. So if that makes sense. But um, those are some ways to identify it. I don't know of any aster family plants off the top of my head. There could be some, but I don't know of any off the top of my head that are poisonous. So don't totally trust that. But um, these, this is pretty similar to a sunflower. So there could be a sunflower that looks like this. So again, make sure to do your due diligence. When I looked it up today in my guidebook, um, the, the main identifying factor was that it had a tuber like this. So that is a way to identify it. But again, if it's growing wild, it may have a smaller tuber. So what I would recommend is to, um, go to a nursery or go online to someone who sells plants that are, um, oh, thank you for sharing that, TD. Did you see if it said anything about the flower being edible? That'd be good to know. Sorry to interrupt myself. <laughs> um, and TD says, no, it didn't. So maybe flower is not so edible. Um, but anyway, yeah, go to a local nursery, find a nursery online that sells native plants and you can buy the tubers of this one and plant them in really rich, loose soil and you'll get big tubers like this. Okay, and what is the best time of year to harvest? That is a great question, yepers, love your name. <laughs> um, and the best time of year to harvest, in my opinion, would I've always harvested it in fall. So that is my opinion. And fall and spring are usually the best time of year to harvest roots. Um, oh, good. Um, TD also is quoting that it is July before they reach a reasonable height and by October they are dying down. So yeah, you really wanna wait till um, all the energy from the plant is going back down into that root. So that's why fall is such a good time. So what you can do now is find them where they're growing, find those scurfy hairs and look for that tuber and then keep an eye on it and go back in the fall and harvest them and use some sort of digging tool, spade would be great or digging fork. So thank you TD for your help in looking that up. I appreciate it. All right, anybody have other questions on sunchokes? Okay, this is our next one. One of my very, very favorites. So this is bee balm. Um, I think it's one of the most beautiful flowers. And um, for those of you who aren't colorblind, uh, but this is a gorgeous red and um, 
Jim Duke, who I love, James Duke, he just passed away a couple years ago, but I was very honored to meet him before he passed and to teach at his garden. So if you don't know who he is, check out the Green Pharmacy book. And he had the Green Pharmacy Gardens where he grew all 80 species that were in that book. It is amazing. It's still there in Maryland if you want to go check it out. Um, but in a, another one of his books, he described these as looking like fireworks. <laughs> and I totally think that they do. It is in the mint family. So you can kind of see in this picture that it has opposite leaves. And so just like a mint family plant, it has a square stem and opposite leaves. And it has these um, kind of tubular flowers. So they are great for pollinators. And uh, I hope that you will grow them because they're just so beautiful. And um, they, I, they're sometimes called wild oregano. And they, the leaves definitely taste like oregano. The leaves, stems, and flowers are edible. You probably wouldn't want to eat the stem, but you can make tea out of it. You can make tea out of the whole above ground plant. So it's really beautiful to um, be able to do that. And um, what else? Let's see. I just, I, oh, sorry back here um well maybe hold on well might not be able to get back but um anyway this is bergamot and i wanted to show both of them to you because they are closely related. They're in the same genus and they, um, so they're both in the Monarda genus. And so the red one is Monarda didyma. This one is Monarda fistulosa. And they are just so gorgeous, right? <laughs> um, and they both are called the other's name sometimes. So sometimes this one is called bee balm. Sometimes the other one is called bergamot. So it's kind of up to you what you call them. But I most generally hear the red one called bee balm and this one called bergamot. But just know they may sometimes be called each other's names. And oh, this is a really good question. Um, so there's two questions here. If I was going to transplant red bee balm, what is the best time of year to do that? Honestly, that's a really good question. Anybody out there have experience doing this? I would say, um, I don't think it matters, honestly. I think I actually have transplanted them before. I don't think that it really matters. Um, just cut them down so that there's just a couple sets of leaves near the bottom, because if they're flowering, that flower will take all the energy and you wanna put some of that energy back into the root so they can strengthen when you transplant them. And then Peggy asked any thoughts on why Monardas tend to get powdery mildew. Um, I've read a little bit on that, Peggy. I can't remember all of it, but I know that part of it um, is if they're growing too close together. I thought that part of it also was if they're not getting enough sun, but um, I have seen them get powdery mildew even in the sun. So I'm not sure if it's a parasite, maybe that is a part of that. Um, but if anybody knows, please comment. And um, I just try and harvest them because uh, early. So like when they first start flowering and then they'll keep growing too throughout the season. So I harvest them um, kind of like I was talking about with the Sochan where you, or like basil, if you're familiar, you can just cut the tops off, but you can go down where there's a couple sets of leaves near the bottom and cut right above those. And then it will stimulate regrowth. And maybe if you keep cutting them, they won't get as much mildew. I'm not sure, but that'd be an interesting little experiment. So um, both of these taste kind of like oregano. My favorite thing to do with them actually is to harvest the leaves 
and um, I will throw them fresh into a coffee grinder and then add them to salt while they're still fresh. And the salt will extract the flavor and it's so delicious. So you can definitely try that. Um, but you can make tea out of any of the above ground parts. They're also both antimicrobial. And so that means they're antiviral and antibacterial. So for this time in history, really wonderful to have around. Um, we're not so much talking about medicinal benefits, but I will say these have a ton of them. So please look them up. Uh, and the other difference is that the red one, the bee balm, tends to grow in wetter, shadier spots, whereas this purple one, bergamot, tends to grow in a little drier and definitely sunnier spots. Um, but they are great to grow in the garden. As far as I've experienced, they grow really well and um, they're beautiful to have around. They'll bring pollinators to your garden and it's so fun to watch the hummingbirds sticking their beaks down into those tubular petals. It's really fun. Also hummingbird hawk moths tend to hang out with them. And if you've never seen one, please look them up. They're freaking amazing. Um, Yepper says, I like to dry the purple and add to rice and beans, lots of flavor. Cool, that is a great idea, I love that. Yeah, so I also will dry it and keep it around all year long and I will um, flavor foods with it as well, just as if it were oregano. So that is a great idea. I throw some into my bone broth too when I'm making it to get that antimicrobial benefit and the taste. Um, so try that. Somebody also, when I posted this on Instagram, which I'm on Instagram at um, the Wander School, all one word, they posted that um, they like to make an oxymel out of it or infuse it into honey. So oxymels are like a combination of honey and vinegar, uh, like usually apple cider vinegar. And I thought that just sounded delicious. So. Uh, try growing both of those if you want to, or you can wild harvest them. They, as long as they're relatively prolific and you're leaving a couple pairs of leaves on the bottom of the plant, it's pretty sustainable to harvest a fair amount of them. Just make sure that you're leaving some behind to regrow and for the pollinators, okay? All right, okay. So berries galore. <laughs> um, these are black raspberries, which are quite possibly my favorite berry. If any of you are here from Ohio or you know Grater's ice cream, you will probably know my favorite flavor, which I think used to be seasonal and now they serve it all the time. It's black raspberry chocolate chip. It is so delicious. Um, so yeah, also wine berries, which are not native, they're from Japan, but also delicious. I don't feel like they get invasive. Some people say they do, but all the more reason why you can harvest as many as you want. And then of course we have blackberries too. So the great thing about berries is you can harvest as many as you want and it's super sustainable because it's just like picking an apple off a tree that doesn't hurt the tree, right? No. So um, yeah, eat the berries, make sure they're ripe first. My trick is to just pull them gently and if they easily come off in my hand, then they're ripe. And they have lots of antioxidants like all the berries. So delish, now is the time, definitely harvest them. And if you let them, if they're growing where you live, they will propagate themselves, it's called layering. One of the canes or some of the canes most likely will just bend themselves over and um, they will kind of bury themselves, like dig themselves into the soil. And then um, they'll shoot up another cane from that. So if you let them, they will propagate themselves super easily, but they do need sun. The more sun they have, the better they will fruit. So just FYI, so you know, and this is a little medicinal tip, which I wasn't gonna talk about, but I feel like it's important. 
Um, if you know about the medicinal aspects of raspberry leaf, the all of these berries that are in the rose family have similar qualities. So as far as being a tonic for um, the female reproductive system, so for the uterus, they're great for that. And my teacher, Leslie Williams, who is awesome, um, said that actually blackberries are even more effective at that. It just happened to be the people writing the book. I think we're, we're writing the books. We're from Europe. And so they uh, have, have raspberries there. And so that's what got into the books. But just so you know, you can start drying your raspberry and blackberry leaves now. Okay, questions about the berries. Freeze them, that's what I do. Just harvest as many as you can and freeze them and then you have them all year long. Okay. Our, okay, so we got another poisonous question. <laughs> Are there any poisonous berries in Western North Carolina? Um, that's, that's a tough question, Kathy. There's so many berries. So it really depends on what you're calling a berry. Um, there are some that are in the tomato family that are definitely poisonous, like nightshades for sure. Um, but there's a lot, a lot, a lot of berries. Some we would never think of as edible, but they're a berry because of the kind of fruit they are and the way that, um, their seeds are organized in the fruit. So that's a tough one. <laughs> um, I don't know of any Hmm, that's not true. <laughs> I just stopped myself. There are some berries that are green that are in the buttercup family, like of the buttercups that look kind of like this. It's what's called a receptacle fruit where they have all these um, little compartments in them and those would be poisonous. So I can't think of any that have receptacles that are like this color that are poisonous. But again, just make sure you have 100% positive ID, um, learn from somebody you trust, preferably, <laughs> doesn't have to be me, but um, somebody that you trust, okay? And just be really careful. Um, TD is asking if you have to ferment the leaves to make tea, what's the best way, etc. cetera. Um, so you don't have to ferment the leaves, but I learned from Leslie Williams that you can ferment the leaves and then they taste kind of like black tea. So that's kind of cool um, because black tea leaves are fermented. Um, and I can't remember how long she said to do that. I don't think it's very long, like a couple of days maybe, but then you actually take like a rolling pin and roll them really good. So it breaks up some of those fibers in the leaves um, or you could hit them really hard with a rolling pin. Um, I don't eat the leaves. I just make them into tea and I will just make them like other medicinal teas that are leaves and I will infuse them or steep them covered in hot water for 20 minutes or so. Good question. All right, so next. Oh, one of my very favorites because I'm so sassy. <laughs> um, I need to get a tattoo of this one just so people will know when they see me coming. <laughs> I'm sorry, bad botanical joke. Anyway, um, this is sassafras, one of my most favorite trees in the whole world and it is very easy to identify because as you can see these leaves, they have three different shapes. So um, one, it's kind of under one of the other leaves, but one of the leaves has three lobes on it. So it looks kind of like a turkey foot. Um, the other, some of the others have two lobes. So they look kind of like a mitten. And then some of them are regular oval leaves. There's only one other plant I know of that does that. And it's a mulberry and it has little teeth on the edges of the leaves and it looks kind of different. So that's helpful. Um, the sassafras root you'll see here in the top corner there, those were some that were dug in the winter. So you can dig it in the winter because 
as we were talking about digging roots before winter and or sorry fall preferably and early spring are the best time so maybe this was late fall or early spring in the winter things go kind of dormant so there's not as much energy in there but i would still harvest them if i wanted or needed them um, but as you can see they tend to be kind of funky shaped so they can be really hard to dig out and i'll try and find the small ones and dig them out um, usually with a digging fork Sometimes it's hard not to spear them with your fork, but a little bit easier than with the spade. And, uh, but it is a lot of work. I'm just gonna let you know that right now. It's totally worth it. And uh, as far as edibility, the leaves are actually edible. And so this is what we call filet gumbo um, or gumbo filet, depending on who you're talking to, or just filet powder. So if you've eaten gumbo before, you've made it, you may know this. And all we have to do to make that filet powder is harvest these leaves. We never wanna take more than 10% off a tree, but if you're harvesting off a big tree, that would be tough to do. Um, but you can spread out your harvest over multiple trees and dry those leaves really well, and then put them into a spice or a coffee grinder and it will grind them up and then you can just keep it around for whenever you're making gumbo but it's also a great thickener for any soup or stew or curry which i like to add it to and the awesome thing about growing them is that they are a host plant for the spice bush swallowtail family or spice bush swallowtail butterfly because they're in the laurel family which is the same family as spice bush and um, that's not mountain laurel, that's like bay laurel, so like bay leaves. It's that same family, but this butterfly is quite beautiful. Um, so any questions about that? Oh, how do I like to dry the leaves? Well, um, pretty simply because they're actually not that wet. So if you have a relatively dry house, then you can um, just, leave them out preferably in a well-ventilated area and they'll probably dry in two to three weeks or so um and jen is asking what do they taste like gosh that's a hard question i don't even really know how to describe that i mean some people say the roots um taste like what is it i mean like root beer for sure I thought somebody said like some disgusting cereal like Lucky Charms or something. Sorry if you like Lucky Charms. <laughs> uh, I don't think it was Lucky Charms. So I think it was another one of those cereals. If anybody knows, put it in the comments. Um, but the really cool thing about sassafras leaves, which might grow some people out, but they are described by my favorite word in herbalism. Some of you know it, mucilaginous. So if you chew up the sassafras leaves, Oh, juicy fruit. That is another one. Yeah, Anna said that they taste like juicy fruit gum. That is something that some people say. So there you go, if you like juicy fruit. Um, so yeah, they're mucilaginous. So interestingly, just like okra and gumbo, do you know what happens like when you cook okra, how it gets kind of slimy? Well, that happens when you chew on or cook sassafras leaves, they get kind of slimy and it doesn't make your gumbo gross or anything. You wouldn't want to put a ton of leaves in there. You don't need very much, maybe like a tablespoon or something. But um, yeah, they get a little slimy, which actually is really great for us medicinally. So it can be really soothing to the throat. Like when I'm talking a lot, sometimes if I'm out on a plant walk, I'll just grab some sassafras leaves and chew them up and it'll be really soothing. So kind of cool, good for our respiratory system, good for our gut and all of our mucous membranes, which are in every organ of our body. So there's some more herbal knowledge for you. Um, so any questions, any other questions? Oh, can you eat right off the tree? Miss Holly, you can eat right off the tree. And um, I was thinking of something funny my friend Jennifer said, and she told me, it's a real thing though, I think she called it direct eating. 
um, or direct feeding, I can't remember, but who can actually like reach over. It always makes me think of a giraffe, but definitely a deer and just reach over and eat straight off the tree. And um, yeah, my friend, um, she said that the trees and plants actually recover more quickly and better if you uh, just break things off or eat them directly off the plant instead of pruning them off, which I thought was super interesting. So, all right. Let's go to the next one, Papa. If y'all know me, you know I had to include this because I'm from Ohio. And Ohio is a big center of paw paw love. <laughs> so um, there's the Paw Paw Festival, which is one of my favorites. And um, I am in North Carolina now, if you didn't know that, but I spent most of my life in Ohio. I still go back and teach there. And so if you're not familiar with Paw Paw, this is a picture of the fruit here in the upper corner. And they are the largest native North American fruit. Pretty cool. Um, they have been spread throughout the forest from Canada down through Florida by Native American people. And um, if you've never seen them, they can get quite large. So, I don't know, maybe like six inches long. They have giant seeds in them that are black. And there are toxins in those seeds and in the skin. So don't eat either of those. Um, I actually am kind of sensitive to pawpaw paw fruit. I've had a reaction that I've heard other people have a reaction to as well, um, where sometimes if I eat them, I think especially if they're older or have been laying on the ground for a while, um, it'll make me nauseous. But it doesn't seem to happen um, if, I, if they're baked into something and they're really delicious because they taste like banana pudding. So when they're baked, if you like banana pudding, you'll love it. And they're really great in things like bread. So paw paw bread, it's kind of like banana bread, but better. And um, you can definitely cultivate them. I have a podcast called Wander Forage and Wildcraft. I'll type that in here if y'all are interested. And in one of the episodes, I interviewed my friend, Doug Crouch, who's in Kentucky, and um, he propagates pawpaws and he sells them. If you want to grow some yourself and you're near Kentucky, and he talks about the way that he propagates them so that he'll get the most fruit. And it's really super duper interesting. So check that out. But basically you just wanna make sure they have enough room between them to get plenty of sunlight and airflow and they'll fruit better. Um, they do love moist, rich woodland. They grow in the understory. So they don't grow very tall They're about 10 feet tall or so, uh, maybe 15 at their very, very tallest. So they like to grow in partial shade or full sun, actually, they fruit the best. I never knew that when I was in school, but found that out from other people. And um, <laughs> Sandra named their cat Papa, I love that. Uh, it's a little confusing sometimes because people in other countries will call papayas Papa, so that is definitely not what we're talking about. But you can harvest them abundantly because again, you're picking a fruit off a tree. So you're not damaging the tree at all. They are a host plant for this beautiful zebra swallowtail butterfly. And um, that is the cool caterpillar for the zebra swallowtail. They're so amazing looking. They utilize what's called mimicry. And so those things, those black parts um, on what looks like the head are actually not eyes. They look like eyes, but they're fake eyes. And that's actually the butt of the caterpillar. And it's to scare off birds, which are one of their predators because it makes them look like a snake. So now you learned a cool tip to tell all your friends. It's interesting though, this picture of the zebra swallowtail because it's on a garlic mustard plant and I haven't seen them do that before. So maybe they could be a host plant for them, who knows? Um, <laughs> and you're welcome. I hope you do listen to that podcast episode. 
Okay, I had to throw in a mushroom, y'all. I just had to because they're freaking delicious and I love them. Um, and it's not just about plants. There's other wild edibles in the forest in the wild, right? So these are chanterelles, one of my most favorite delicious mushrooms. And they are this beautiful golden yellow color. Um, they, you have to be careful though. They do definitely have a poisonous lookalike, which I'm gonna show you next. Um, but make sure for sure that you know what you're harvesting, 100% positive identification again. Um, but some of the ways we can identify them are how these tops are kind of vase shaped. So it's like convex and um, they supposedly have false gills. Mycologists don't like that when you call things false, but um, some people call them ridges because they're not technically a separate appendage like a gill. They are a ridge on that underside of the mushroom. Uh, the stems and the caps are pretty much the same color. They have a solid stem all the way throughout. They grow on the ground. So that can be a little deceptive, as you'll see in the next slide, because they, when I say they grow on the ground, I mean they don't grow on wood. So, um, that can be confusing because sometimes there will be roots in the ground that mushrooms are growing off of or some kind of rotting wood buried in the ground, but these don't grow on wood. So that can be a little hard to tell. Um, some people say they smell like apricots, which I've noticed sometimes, but not every time. So don't totally depend on that, especially if you don't have a great sense of smell. You can harvest these abundantly because they are like picking fruit off a tree because most of their bodies are actually underground in the mycelium. So that's kind of cool. Um, they tend to grow in a little bit more open areas like this, like road cuts. So like maybe where a logging road went through or is going through. Um, they'll also grow like where the land is eroded. So, um, Sometimes you'll see them going down a hill. And so watch for that because their spores will also travel downhill with the rain. So that's kind of cool. Um, here, oh, here's a question. Um, do the false chanterelles smell like apricot? Not that I have noticed or know of. Good question. So here's the lookalike. This is jack-o'-lantern. Um, it has that name because some of them will actually glow in the dark. It's so crazy. So um, that's one way <laughs> that you might be able to tell who it is, but they are poisonous. They can be a differing degree of poisonous depending on who's eating them. Um, if it's somebody who has impaired health or is maybe an elder, it might affect them more. So um, at best, it will give you some digestive upset. At worst, I have heard it can affect, actually have effects on the heart. So we really don't want to risk it. Um, but some things we can tell that are a little bit different here. Um, I'm actually... Don't look at this bottom picture. <laughs> that does not uh, look very much like the jack-o'-lanterns, but it is good to know that they can look a little bit more chanterelle-like. Um, but look at this picture on the top and how they're growing in a cluster like this. That is um, very much what you will see with the jack-o'-lanterns. They love to grow in clusters. And here's what I was talking about, about it being deceptive, things growing on the ground or off of wood, because these look like they're growing right out of the ground, but they're actually growing on a root or rotting wood in the ground. So maybe an old stump or something. So, um, but you'll see how they have a more defined cap, usually more like a toadstool. Um, and they can, you can make dye out of them, which is pretty cool. They actually make a purple dye. So that's pretty awesome. So again, 100% positive ID, really important. 
Right. Okay. Any questions about that? No. Okay. So here are some Reese's resources for you. Um, I will send out this video to everybody uh, once I have uploaded it to YouTube. So you don't have to um, write these all down now. You could also take um, a picture of it if you want to. These are just some of the books that I recommend. I'm not really going to go through them right now, but they can be really helpful. Um, along with Peterson's guide, make sure you're looking in your region. So most of us here are in Appalachia. So it would be the Eastern and North. I think it's the same edition, North and East. Um, Peterson's guide to edible plants. They also have a guide to medicinal plants. Um, and some websites for you, mine, of course. <laughs> uh, I meant uh, you can't really click on this in where you're at probably, but thewanderschool.com is my website. There's blogs and things. Also, if you check out the, the Wander School, all one word on social media, I post lots of things about wild plants and mushrooms. Um, plants for a Future is the one that I talked about. And so that is pfaf.org, P-F-A-F.org. Please donate to them if you can. They do lots of great work. They combine basically hundreds of sources and put it all on one website. So super great. Um, United Plant Savers, so UPS, oh, Plants for a Future, that's not right. Don't look at that. <laughs> um, but United Plant Savers does amazing work. You can join for, I think, like 35 bucks a year. And they preserve wild medicinal plants and put out great newsletters and things. So um, Kathy says, FYI, Green Mountain Plant Company sells pawpaws, et cetera. They're often at the Yancey County Burnsville Farmers Market on Saturdays. Thanks so much for, for sharing that. I've actually been wanting to check them out. So if you're near me in Burnsville, North Carolina, check them out. Um, oh, and I just wanted to let you know, if you wanna learn more and you're in the area, um, Asheville area, Burnsville area, nearby in Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia. I'm leading a plant walk this coming Saturday and you can, oh, I should put a link to that. Well, the link is right here, but um, yeah, you can come with us and there's a waterfall there. It's quite beautiful. If anybody came to the last one, then you know, but um, it's actually a 734, I think, acre retreat center. So it's really beautiful. Um, I think it's about 45 minutes from Asheville uh, North and up in the mountains near the Blue Ridge Parkway. So it'll be quite lovely. And um, oh, Paw Paw Fest in September at West Virginia University. Cool, thank you for commenting there, Yepers. Um, and now, yeah, come to the plant walk if you wanna join us or check out thewanderschool.com. And there's other cool things happening with the Cherokee Urban Heritage Crop School that will be up there later as we get um, courses going. So put subscribe at thewanderschool.com if you wanna learn about all the upcoming things too. Number one, I wanna say thank you so much for being here. And number two, we have a few minutes um, for Q and A. So if you have questions, I may have answers or you may have answers and you can chip in. So if anybody has questions, please contribute. Thank you, Peggy, that is so sweet. I love that I'm so much fun. That's great to hear, thanks. So who has a question? Do you have questions about any of the plants that we talked about um, or general <laughs> questions? The yeah, upper is calling me Sassy Abby. I love that. This could be my new nickname. <laughs> Y'all are all welcome. Thank you so much for your sweetness. And um, any questions? Anybody? Again, you will get the recording of this 
also. And it will be at the Wander School YouTube page as well. So um, you can find it there along with some other cool info. Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing so you can see. And if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask questions in real time. Um, and Oh, thank you, Toy Lynn. And Peggy says it's a lot to process. It really is, y'all. It is a lot, but the thing to remember is you don't have to learn it all at the same time. So my recommendation is to start with one plant and really get to know that plant. Preferably pick something that grows right outside your door and learn everything you can about that plant. As long as you are sure you know what it is, then you can make tea out of it or eat it. And um, yeah, and, and get to know it in all of the different ways. Uh, Sandra asks, I haven't noticed many butterflies in South Carolina, but I have lots of pollinators. When do they come? Okay, I'm gonna answer that in a minute, but I'm actually going to stop recording. And so if y'all want to come on in person and ask questions, you can more comfortably, but thank you all for being here. And if you need to go, I totally respect your time. And thanks so much. Happy wandering, foraging and wild crafting. And we have a couple more minutes for questions. 